If Li Bo is the rebellious outsider of the Tang Dynasty poetic firmament, Du Fu is his uh, insider counterpart. He is Du Fu is generally acknowledged to be the uh, the greatest poet of uh, of this period. Uh, perhaps because he, he wears this mantle as a kind of official declaration, perhaps because he's a little bit more of a, uh, uh, he's a little bit more socially acceptable in certain respects. He is uh, generally aligned more with Confucianism and its, um, and its emphasis on social obligation and outside, right, and outside behavior, uh, social engagement and obligation and all of that stuff. Whereas Li Bo was more of a, uh, Li Bo was more of a Taoist, was more of an internalist, was more self-centered, let's say. Uh, du Fu was much more engaged in a public project in his, uh, in his art. Uh, you can see that throughout. He did live through a very tumultuous time of rebellion and warfare, and he he maintained the the Confucian uh, edict, if you will, uh, or at least the emphasis on the poet's role as recording history. So what you get in Du Fu are a lot of little scenes that uh, give a sense of the history, that tell a story, that uh, paint the details in on a very uh, fractious time in world history. Um, you can see this in, in just the shortest lyrics. Uh, generally, he wrote fairly short lyrics, but even in, in the simplest ones, you, you get these little notes that he's drawing that give you a sense of uh, the physical realities uh, he sees in front of him, in front of him as he uh, wanders around the country, but also the the deeper meanings and the moods throughout the country. Um, Painted hawk, uh, windblown frost rises from plain white silk. A gray falcon, paintwork's wonder. Body strains its thoughts on an, on a cunning hair. Its eyes turn sidelong like a Turk in despair. You could pinch the rays glinting on tie ring, its stance to be called to the column's rail. When will it strike the common birds? Bloody feathers strewing the weed colored plain. Just a simple imagery of nature, but it's one of potential violence, uh, potential devastation. Um, this, uh, this sense of the, the hawk is a bird of prey and it is eyeing prey and in that moment we're capturing this moment where the the hawk sees something and is about to launch perhaps an attack uh this is the potentiality of violence in nature which Dufu was very accustomed to having seen human nature just rear up in uh, and devastate whole landscapes in front of him. Uh, his entire world was turned upside down a couple of times by warfare. Um, but that that inherent potential within even the most simple scenes um, holds a threat. Uh, Moonlight Night. <laughs> this is this is sort of a sentimental favorite, uh, but it gives again. There's uh, there's this context of warfare and suffering. Uh, Moonlight Night from her room in Fuzu tonight, all alone. She watches the moon far away. I grieve that her children can't understand why she thinks of Chang'an. Fragrant mist in her cloud, in her cloud hair, damp, clear, lucerne. Clear loose sense on the jade arms cold. When will we lean by the chamber curtains and let it light the two of us? Our tear stains dry. Um, well, it, it, it makes me... Somewhere out there uh, beneath the pale moonlight, uh, he's thinking of his wife and his children, and he is separated from them because of the warfare, because of the conflict. And so he's looking up at the moon, 
and imagining her looking up at the moon and this is the only way they can be together. It's a togetherness defined and contextualized entirely by separation, suffering, and pain. Um, and they're wondering, he's imagining if there can ever be a time when they will be able to be together and their tears are no longer there. Um, it's sweet and it's the kind of issue that can elude the history books, but he records it as not just a personal thing and not just a personal uh, reminiscence or reflection, but as something to give an idea of this is part of the fabric of society at this time. He's not just writing about himself because there are a lot of people who have been displaced and are looking up at the moon perhaps and wondering about their own loved ones. Uh, Spring Prospect, one of his more famous uh, images of the war. Um, the nation shattered, mountains and rivers remain, city and spring, grass and trees burgeoning, feeling the times, blossoms draw tears, hating separation, birds alarm the heart, beacon fires three months in, in succession, a letter from home worth 10,000 in gold, white hairs, fewer for the scratching, soon too few to hold up, to hold a hairpin up. And here you get the sense of, again, uh, great concision. It's very short, but there's a lot of energy between these lines. Uh, simple pairs of opposites. Uh, the nation shattered. Uh, I, I think Pauline Yu does a translation where it's uh, the, uh, the, the country shattered. And then that you can match very easily against city. Well, it's the city and the country are both devastated. But what is still there? Well nature. Mountains and rivers, grass and trees. Uh, life and death. Nature, civilization. All of this bumping up against one another in a kind of natural conflict that seems forever antagonistic but is ultimately part of a much bigger uh, image of nature in existence. Uh, the feeling of loss, the evocation of it, uh, feeling the times, just um, hating separation, again, from your loved ones, beacon fires, trying to send signals over long distances, a letter from home is worth 10,000 in gold. Well, what, you know, what soldier hasn't thought that, waiting for a word from home um, and the sense of aging and the passing of time and how this is all just prematurely aging so many because of the worry and the suffering. Um, another great image of warfare and devastation. Lofted and lifted west of the clouds of red, the trek of the sun descends to a, to a level earth by the Brushwood gate, songbirds and sparrows chaffer, and the homebound stranger from a thousand li arrives. Wife and children marvel that I am here. When the shock wears off, they still, still they wipe away tears. In the disorders of the age, I was tossed and flung. That I return alive is a happening of chance. Neighbors swarm up the tops of the walls, touched and sighing. Even they sob and weep. The night wastes on, and still we hold a candle across from from another, as if asleep and in a dream. I personally crack up an awful lot. I, well, I break up a lot. <laughs> when when I see the videos of soldiers coming home after you know 18 months away, they surprise their kids in school at a auditorium assembly or something like that and you see the kid jump up and run into uh, the parents arms that they haven't seen in a year and a half and it's just heartbreaking and that's what we have here and somebody just returns and you get a sense of the devastation that this has wrought on a human personal family social level um, you can read the statistics and history books of warfare and battles and dates and all of that stuff, but these little images record the human toll that is taken. 
Um, my thatched roof is ruined by the autumn wind. A sense of just utter vulnerability and uh, more devastation. Uh, it, it's a thatch roof. It's not particularly strong to begin with, and it gets ripped off. He, uh, he sees more humiliation when little kids scamper up and start to gather it and steal it, essentially. And, you know, what more can be taken from this person? Uh, and uh, again, that line, you know, I have lived through upheavals and ruin, uh, which is the same line as you heard in Kiang Village. In the disorders of the age, I was tossed and flung, the sense of vulnerability from fate. Um, I have lived through the upheavals and ruin and have seldom slept very well, but have no idea how I shall pass this night of soaking. It's cold at night. Um, it, it, it's it's misery, it's suffering, and he starts to conjure a dream. Oh, to own a mighty mansion of a hundred thousand rooms, a great roof for the poorest gentlemen of all this world, a place to make them smile, a building unshaken by wind or rain as solid as a mountain. Oh, when shall I see before my eyes a towering roof such as this? Then I'd accept the the ruin of my own little hut and freeze and death by freezing. Um, it's an idealization, a dream, a fantasy, uh, and, and he indulges in it to take him away perhaps for just a moment from the reality, but the reality is there and the reality won't leave. And ending on that phrase, death by freezing, it reminds him you can't escape. The material world is always with us. Confucianism. Um, mm, uh, no, 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 no. Spending the night in a tower by the river. A visible darkness grows up mountain paths. I lodge by river, gate high in a study. Frail clouds on a cliff edge, passing the night. The lonely moon topples amid the waves. Steady, one after another. A line of cranes in flight, howling over the wind. Wild dogs and wolves. No sleep for me. I worry over battles. I have no strength to right the universe. He hears suffering in the distance. He hears the howling of wolves and, and wild dogs clearly closing in on something or perhaps already pouncing. Um, he hears it, but he just, he can't help. He's, the pain and suffering of other human beings is just beyond his ken right now. And he has no strength to right the universe. There's no room for heroism here. There's no capacity for it. He is... Uh, only human. Um, thoughts while traveling by night. Again, interesting uh, economy. Light breeze on a fine grass, I stand alone at the mast. Stars lean on the wild, on the vast wild plain. Moon bobs on the great river's spate. Letters have brought no fame. Office too old to obtain. Drifting, what am I like? A gull between earth and sky. Uh, look at the conflict we have going on there. Look at the contrast that he's drawing, the polarities. Uh, in the first, light breeze on fine grass. Oh, okay. We're on grass. I stand alone at the mast. Mast? We're on water now. Stars lean on the vast wild plain. Okay, we're back on land. Moon bobs in the great river spate. All right, water again. Um, the, you've got these contrasts. You've got land and water, the uh, the plain, the field, and the river. You've got stars and moon. 
Uh, and then you get down to letters, have brought no fame, office, too old to obtain. Uh, his art, his literature, it, it doesn't, nobody seems to care. Um, he's not really making any waves there. Uh, and in politics, the imperial bureaucracy, he's always getting shunted from here and the other. He, as a poet, uh, or as a, as a man, uh, Du Fu was a functionary within the imperial government, but uh, he kept uh, with his, uh, with the political reversals of the time, uh, he was always getting shunted off to little backwaters and he was never going to get anywhere. And he was recognizing that. So you get, again, more vulnerability, not just in, uh, not just to nature or to warfare, but just the everyday, everyday stuff of life is his job he feels very vulnerable in he can't seem to he can't seem to succeed at anything um so again letters literature and office politics so art and worldly affairs are again two polarities that are sort of pulling him and, and but he's not steady on any of them uh he is a gull between the earth and the sky. He's another being just between these two giant poles that uh, he's not part of either. He's vulnerable. Um, um, I don't want to go into that. Autumn Meditations uh, is a, I think it's an eight poem uh, series where you get a lot of uh, really concise um, uh, evocations of the uh, again of, of the of the of the countryside of the human. Uh, it's a portrait of humanity during a time of change. Uh, he's uh, he is going around looking at things, noting with great precision um, physical presences, uh, uh, cities, roads, places people know. Um, mountains that are unchanging and the physical permanence of them implies the alternative which is the mm, impermanence of everything that is outside that uh, there are lots of uh, mountains but not a lot of people spoken of the uh, the impermanence of culture, the impermanence of humanity, of civilization, the vulnerability of that is implied in the insistence of okay, and there's there's that mountain um, in the in was it uh, stanza four? I've heard them say Chang'an's like a chessboard. Sad beyond bearing the happenings of these hundred years, mansions of peers and princes, all with new owners now. In civil or martial cap and garb, not the same as before, over drum, over mountain passes, due north, gongs and drum, drums resound, wagons and horses pressing west, speed the feather, feather deck dispatches, fish and dragons sunk in steep, stuck in sleep, autumn rivers cold, my homeland, those peaceful times forever in my thoughts. All these images that he's racking through and he, he just, he can't leave them behind because it's all he has. Everything else is so um, evanescent, so fleeting. Um, the, the chessboard, think about it. Uh, what it, the chessboard remains, the pieces topple over, the pieces disappear. And that's an interesting image right there. Um, Chang'an, the city, is like a chessboard, sad beyond bearing the happenings of these hundred years. So he's making a very direct analogy to, okay, all the people and all the figures collapse, but the landscape remains the same. The physical reality is unchanging, but everything else is completely vulnerable. Um, it's not the same as before. Mansions of peers and princes, all with new owners now. 
Um, again, the Confucian emphasis on recording history. Well, what happens in uh, in warfare uh, when you get when you conquer something? You confiscate all of the uh, the spoils of war, and that would include the nice houses because they have new government officials moving in and taking over, and these are the big people in town now. Uh, but it just points out your own vulnerability. It just points out how nothing is permanent but the physical space. The house is still there, the mansions are still nice, but the people in them are very different. Maybe they'll be different again, and there's no way to ensure against that. It's, it's vulnerable. He is a great poet, Du Fu, of physical reality, of futility, of uh, horror. The uh, Ballad of the Army Carts is another fun one where he gives a, an interesting portrait of uh, uh, an army moving through the countryside. Uh, carts rattles and squeak, horses snort and neigh, bows and arrows at their waist, the conscripts march away. Fathers, mothers, children's wives run to say goodbye. The Zhang Yang bridge in clouds of dust is hidden from the eye. They tug at them and stamp their feet, weep and obstruct their way. The weeping rises to the sky. Along the road a passerby questions the, the conscripts. They reply. And then you get the perspective of the soldiers, the conscripts. They're not there voluntarily. They mobilize us constantly, set northwards at 15 to guard the river. We were forced one more to volunteer, though we are 40 now, to man the western front this year. The headmen hide our head cloths for us when we first left here. We came back white-haired to, to, to be sent again to the frontier. Those frontier posts could fill the sea with the blood of those who died, but still the martial emperor's aim remains unsatisfied. And, and, and it goes on, and, and they're trying to point out that this is all pointless. Uh, you know, in village after village, only thorns and brambles grow. They keep going, but they're not really, it's not really worthwhile. Why do they continue if they're just not really getting anything? Um, it's, it's futile. Um, uh, the district offer, officers come to press the land tax from us nonetheless, but sir, how can we possibly pay having a son, having a son's a curse today, far better to have daughters, get them married, a son will lie, will, will lie lost in the grass, unburied. It's just a horror show, and he is cataloging it, he, he is describing it, he is recording it for history. He is a Confucian. He is doing this out of a sense of obligation. This is what a poet is supposed to do in the Confucian view. But it's more than that because he's bringing so much personal pain to it. You, you don't have to know an awful lot about Du Fu's life to know that, okay, he had some rough breaks along the way. Things did not go his way. He was heralded as the greatest poet of China only long after his death. And until that death, he was just another schmo. He was just plugging along, trying to make some sort of a mark. And every time he thought he did, it came to nothing. Everything he did seemed to be futile. And so he brings that perspective, that fatalistic, um, withered perspective to everything that he sees. So when he sees a landscape, when he sees a village that's been hollowed out of its people, he understands. He understands the senselessness. He understands the pain. He understands the human content beneath the simple 
physical data.